generations to come. And welcome to another edition of the TDN Writers Room. My name is Bill Finley. I'm a correspondent for the TDN Unfortunately, a big Boston Red Sox fan. Oh, Bill, <laughs> this is uh, Randy Moss with NBC Sports back home where there are where I live. No mudslides, no floods, no people being evacuated. Uh, Zoe Cabin with First Racing in Santa Anita. We are currently building an ark. Now, they canceled racing on Sunday and the rains actually didn't come till about three o'clock, but it's been raining steadily since and it's supposed to rain all day. So if you look on the news, I've got it over in the corner. All you're seeing is women in rain boots, brand new rain boots and umbrellas <laughs> showing pictures of puddles and a little bit of flowing water. But it will get bad. There have been several mudslides already. But I think where I am and Santa Anita is concerned, we're going to be absolutely fine. It's just it's a little wet. That's all. I'm going to a water park later, like because it's not wet enough outside. I'm going to one <laughs> with a whole lot of children. My worst nightmare uh, in a Petri dish at a water best. park. So wish me luck. Uh, you'll need it, Zoe. <laughs> you'll definitely need it. Bacteria. That's the key word. Going oh, to a water oh, park with kids. You'll know yeah. why. <laughs> All right, guys. Horse racing talk. Isn't that what we're here for? Uh, by the way, we're uh, brought to you each and every week by Keeneland. We thank them for their sponsorship. So we talked last week about the decision of the Baffert owners to keep their horses with him, which then meant they couldn't run in the Kentucky Derby. It's a storyline that we're probably going to be talking about every single week. And Churchill Downs' worst nightmare came true on Saturday when Nisos won the uh, Robert B. Lewis by open lengths. He looks like to me, I don't want to get too carried away, but he reminds me of Justify and also sort of the path that Justify took to get to the Kentucky Derby. So they they wanted, no, Churchill Downs wanted no controversy at the Derby at 150. They didn't want Baffert to be there, be the story on when they're celebrating the 150th Derby. Instead, I think what they've done is create a bigger controversy than ever, especially if the Baffert horses continue to do well on the road to the Triple Crown, because the story is not going to be who's in the Kentucky Derby. It's going to be where is Bob Baffert? Randy? You're exactly right. Assuming Niso stays healthy uh, and he makes it to the first Saturday in May in good shape and we assume will be pointed for the Preakness at that point, I think uh, Churchill Downs is looking at a scenario in which uh, for their prized 150 year anniversary celebration of the Kentucky Derby, uh, you know, the big story that people are going to be talking about is the fact that you've got a potential triple crown winner, assuming Nisos goes on and wins the Santa Anita Derby like he did, uh, uh, you know, uh, the race on Saturday. That's uh, not there. And I, I've had people tell me, oh, Churchill Downs doesn't care. They're going to have, it's going to be sold out. Every seat's going to be taken. They're going to make all their money. I think they do care. Um, I, when Churchill Downs announces its stakes schedule every year, okay, uh, typically, and I've gone back and looked at the news articles in past years, it's usually in either March or mid-February. This year, they announced their stakes schedule along with the, the new $5 million derby purse, January the 10th. I don't think that was an accident. I think they released that stakes schedule with the new purse for the derby, intentionally slightly before the deadline for the owners to to transfer their horses away from Bob Baffert. I think they kind of maybe feared in the back of their mind that there might be a little backlash from Baffert's owners because this seems like a little bit um, a little bit of a personal thing to extend the ban from two years to three years and to try to maybe inoculate themselves from that. Uh, they wanted to make sure the owners knew ahead of time that, hey, the purse this year, it's going to be up to $5 million. So I think they do care about getting the very best horses in the Kentucky Derby. And I think they will definitely care if Nisos goes on. And to me, he looks like the best horse Baffert's had since Justify. If he continues on that, on that role, uh, it's going to be a big story on the first Saturday in May that they wish they didn't have to deal with. 
Yeah, you you guys hit the the nail right on the head. It's going to be a huge story. But before we get ahead of the story, let's talk about the horse. How good was Nisos on Saturday? We saw his two previous starts, 96, 97 buyer. He popped 105 with Pratt, seemingly just not moving in the irons. Now, I was in the paddock. I can remember looking at this horse at the two-year-old sales. Best of luck, sold him. He worked in nine and four. Beautiful mover, medium-sized horse. Kind of, he was a cool dude is what I wrote in the catalog. Good mover, cool dude, not overly big. Medium size, kind of like a brown paper bag. And seeing him in the paddock on Saturday, I'm watching him walk around. I'm standing next to Kurt Hoover from FanDuel. I'm like, ah, this doesn't seem like there's much sparkle there today. He just walked around the paddock like an old pony. Not very big, just this little unassuming brown paper bag. He gets on the racetrack. Yeah, nothing. Gates open. He's on it. Perfect ride by Pratt, didn't get away, terribly great, got into a good position, took some dirt, did everything you want to see. And when Pratt pressed the button, he just absolutely took off. It was flawless from Nisos, and they really are going to miss him from the Derby. And one other thing that, you know, I think we should mention is the Derby point system. Now, obviously, Baffert's horses aren't eligible for the points, so those points are negated. But if Baffert just say, you know, just say Baffert was to win every prep, run first and second like he did on Saturday, he might theoretically keep out the second, third best horse out of the Derby because they're not garnering those points. So I think trainers are going to have to look at where's Bob going? What if he's taking this one this way? What if he's taking that one that way? Obviously, that did not happen on Saturday at Oaklawn with his horse running there, but it's certainly something to be considered, don't you think? Oh, I, I, yeah. Go ahead, Randy. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a potential scenario where if Nisos, uh, you know, heads to the Santa Anita Derby and you're the owner or trainer of a really good three-year-old out there who needs points badly to get in the Kentucky Derby, you may yeah. be forced to leave town to run right. in a prep elsewhere to get away from Nisos, which is going to make the competition even easier for Nisos in the Santa Anita Derby and make it even more likely that he's going to win by eight or nine or ten or whatever. But, man, I agree with you. He looked – and I know, Bill, you got to feel the same way. He looked awesome. Yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to get back to that point. And, um, you know, I didn't doubt that he would run well, but he did have a couple tests to get by. This was his first race around two turns. Um, it was obviously uh, against stiffer competition. Uh, Baffert, and, and you remember, Baffert ran one, two here, too. So you talk about those derby points. Here we go. He didn't just win the race. He ran second. And, Randy, you and I brought up the same horse. Look, I can't call him the next justify after three starts. Right. Um, and we're not probably if he doesn't run the Kentucky Derby, he's not going to be able to be the next justify because he's not able to win the Triple Crown. But he's definitely the horse that uh, reminds me most of him. And, you know, I, again, careful not to get too carried away here with a hyperbole or whatnot. But I do agree what you, with what you said 100 percent of all the good three year olds Baffert has had. This is the best one since um uh, justify and and you know what and he's got five or six good ones behind him as well so you know it could be what if um you know may moon the uh, horse that broke his mane what if he comes in and starts winning everything left and right it might not be just about nisos and uh you know churchill you shot yourselves in the foot guys yeah and how about the day that pratt had the week that pratt has had three stakes on saturday at santa anita he's won seven stakes this year including the pegasus world cup so he's on an absolute tear as of now and looks like he's got the best older sprinter, best three-year-old filly and the best three-year-old colt in Southern California right at his fingertips. Do want to remind you that the TDN Writers Room is brought to you each and every week by Keeneland. Tickets for the Keeneland Spring Meet, which runs from April the 5th through April the 26th, will go on sale on February the 20th. And Keeneland, again, is accepting entries for the 2024 April Horses of Racing Age sale, which will be held on Friday, April the 26th, after the races, on closing day of the spring meet. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. At Keeneland, a horse will always be measured in hands. Hands that see. 
that send, that speak. Hands that hold our sport to a higher standard. Not for our sake, but for theirs. For the love of the horse. For generations to come. The Fastest Source of the Week is brought to you by the Fast Sires at Windstar Farm. Windstar Stallion Audible's sons and daughters are making noise on the track. You get that wordplay there? Audible, making noise. Three-year-old Philly likes it. Thank you, Zoe. Three-year-old Philly. I didn't write it, but I'm reading it. Three-year-old Philly likes and Audible earned her first graded stakes win when she rallied on the Holy Bull undercard for Mike Rapoli and Todd Pletcher to win the $175,000 Sweetest Chant Stakes, grade three. And now with his debut crop, Audible ranks third among active sires. Here's a new metric. By average winning buyer speed figure. It's a 68, which ranks higher than sires like Justify, Quality Road, and Tap It. And better yet, Audible stands for only $15,000 at Windstar Farm. Fastest source of the week, as usual. We've already talked about him, and that would be Nysos. As you guys mentioned, he upped his ante there uh, last weekend with a career-high buyer speed figure of 105, which definitely puts him in that range in February of horses like Justify and even American Pharaoh. So Nysos is our fastest source of the week. Well, the fastest horse of the week did not come out of the Holy Bull Stakes, where the buyer figure was a 90, but it was won by Hades, co-owned by former TDN Writers Room podcaster John Green. But of course, the big story was not so much who won, it was who didn't. Fierceness at one to five, I didn't think there was any a prayer that he could lose this race. I mean, on form numbers, matter of fact, uh, you, you look at the numbers and the thoroughgraph sheets and the buyers, I, I mean, he literally looked like he was 15 lengths faster than anybody else. Um, what did he do? He ran a flat, kind of lifeless race, settled in for third behind Hades and a Chad Brown horse that came up to finish second. Um, I checked in with Mike Rapoli yesterday to find out if the horse came out of the race. Okay. He said he did. Uh, I said, what was the problem? He blamed it all on the trip. Uh, Zoe, I didn't think this horse's trip was that bad at all. Um, and I think there's nothing else you can do but call it a very disappointing effort. It was disappointing. Yes, it was. And what Fierceness has shown in the two starts that he's been badly beaten is he has not managed to overcome adversity and a little bit of trouble, which makes a really good horse. You don't have to be the best horse, but you have to be able to overcome stuff, especially when you're going forward in these big triple crown races with big fields. Now, he broke okay, he got a little bit pinch, and Johnny V did the right thing. He wanted to ride him like the best horse, so he sent him forward and he sent him hard, and he got position going into that turn. Now, the fact that he sent him so hard lit a fire under Fierceness's bum, if you want to call it that, and he was a little bit ranked down the backside and jumped right into the bridle, probably a little bit more than Johnny V wanted him to do. And from then, I, I think maybe he ran his race down the backside or things just didn't go his way after being pinballed at the start. But if you're going to be a champion, you need to be able to overcome a little bit more adversity than that. And I don't know if he just needs a bit more racing, a bit more seasoning to be able to overcome something like that. But it was a disappointing effort, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I think Mike Rapoli was right. And I think you guys are right. I think both statements are true. I thought he did get into some significant trouble early in the race for a horse that likes to be placed where he likes to be placed up, up near the front. Uh, it required, you know, some, uh, interventionalist tactics by John Velasquez to get him up there. But I thought the early trouble was significant. Uh, but I also thought he was disappointing. Because even though he did get a little, get a little keen, get a little rank when, uh, when Johnny lit him up to get him up there, they went to half in 50 and the first quarter in 25. So it's not like he used an excessive amount of energy to have to rush up into that kind of a pace. And when he takes a half length lead or so or a neck lead, late back stretch going, going around the second turn, 
You're supposed to win a race like that, even with the early trouble, if you have the sort of talent advantage that it looked like fierceness had on paper. And instead, as you pointed out, now both starts, the Champagne is a two-year-old, and now the Holy Bull, in which he's encountered, you know, any sort of adverse circumstances, uh, he did not handle it well at all. Now, what does this mean going forward? It may be the Breeders' Cup Juvenile all over again if he comes back in the in the Florida Derby um, and gets the kind of trip that he got in the Breeders' Cup. And it, it makes the horse a bit of an enigma. But I definitely agree that I thought he was disappointing. Hades, on the other hand, um, you know, he was really impressive in the allowance win on New Year's Eve. Uh, when he ran the last eighth of a mile and 12 and change uh, after setting the pace in a one-turn mile race. And, I mean, his stretch kick from the eighth pole to the wire in the Holy Bull was flattered a little bit by the fact that fierceness at that point was going the other direction. Uh, and and so was the other horse that was up there. But still, I mean, I I don't I wouldn't put Hades right now, you know, uh, in my really upper tier of Kentucky Derby contenders. But I do put him somewhere like in the track phantom range, the horse of Asmussen's that we saw win the Lacombe. I think they're kind of comparable horses, uh, you know, nice horses. Uh, and Hades looked, uh, you know, he good for Joe. Uh, Congratulations to Joe Orsino. He he looks like a legitimate Derby horse. Randy, when the um, apparently the, you guys changed the figure um, after the uh, originally given the horse an eighty five, then it's a ninety, and the ninety at this point for three year old prep race is not good anyways. But right. eighty five looks even worse. What what was the story behind that? Well, unfortunately, anybody that makes speed figures, uh, regardless of whether you're the buyer team or Equibase or Ragazin or Thoroughgraph, is aware of the challenges right now in making numbers at Gulfstream Park because they have three distinct racing surfaces that divide mm -hmm. up all the races each day. And the sample size is not very big. Um, initially, we went back and we looked at uh, Hades' allowance win on March the 31st, okay, which was given a buyer speed figure that day of an 84. And an 84 looked like it was the right number for New Year's Eve at Gulfstream Park. But there were only three dirt races that day, and they were all for two-year-olds. And all the horses coming out of those races have come back and have run much better numbers than we gave them. So we all put our heads together, and in hindsight, we looked at things, and we upped Hades's. New Year's Eve win from an 84 to a 90, because that's what the evidence showed. And therefore, it looked like that that was the logical number for the Holy Bull. You couldn't go by your normal track variant because the pace was so slow. So you had to kind of make an educated guess as to what the number probably should be. So now, officially, that's why Hades has, uh, ne next time he runs, you'll see in the form his last two races, 90 and 90. I just wanted to mention really quick, guys. Um, we mentioned this last week, Ocala Stud, the breeders on Hades. Oh, this horse was probably in the field with fierceness at some time because they, they broke all the babies there for Rapoli. So Ocala Stud are going to have a big role in this year's Kentucky Derby at some point. And they're really good horsemen down there and do a terrific job. So just I just wanted to give the O'Farrells a, a quick shout out for the great work that they're doing. Maybe Hades recognized him. Maybe, maybe he was, uh, he remembered him from the field and said, wait a second, I remember this horse. I can't, I can't outrun this horse. Uh. <laughs> All right, guys, let's head down to Oaklawn Park where they uh, ran the Southwest Stakes. And uh, this one was hard to see coming. I mean, Mystic Dan, trained by Ken McPete, who we're going to talk to a little bit later as the Green Group guest of the week. He ran a terrific race, uh, wins by eight lengths, got a 101 uh, buyer figure. I thought perhaps the difference was that they used different tactics. They took him off the pace this time, whereas before he was closer to the pace. And he certainly seemed to um, react well to that. He also uh, got to give credit to Brian Hernandez Jr. He pulled a Ryan Moore. I mean, he cut every corner, stayed on that rail and got the job done. And 
even though he didn't win and even though he's beaten eight lengths, kind of fun to see Wayne Lucas get in there with just steel, pick up a few points because, you know, Wayne, if his horse can make the derby, he's going to get him in there. But, um, you know, Randy, how seriously you take this horse? I mean, some people may say, oh, it was the mud. That's why what it was. Um, I want to see what he does in his next start, which is presumably going to be the Arkansas Derby. But hey, this was a very good performance from this horse. It was a sloppy track, and maybe he absolutely loved a sloppy track. He got a rail run on both turns. Improbable from the number 10 post, but Brian Hernandez steered him right to the inside, and that probably worked in his favor as well. Smarty Jones, the last time he ran, he was up on the pace. I think the new tactics made a big difference as well. But I tell you what, that horse was striding out now the last quarter of a mile, you look at him running down the lane and you're like, wow. I mean, here's how well that horse ran, okay? Uh, nice O's ran his last quarter mile in 25.54 seconds at Santa Anita. He wasn't being asked. You know, he was he was well within himself, but a nice run. Hades ran his final quarter of a mile in the Holy Bull in 25.66 seconds, Okay. Uh, the Southwest final quarter mile for the winner was 23.74 seconds. That's close to two full seconds faster than Nisos ran his final quarter. I'm not suggesting this horse is Nisos in any way, but the way he was striding out the last quarter mile was not an illusion. That horse was doing some serious running down the stretch of the Southwest, and that's why you got a buyer figure of 101. He looked incredible, and not only visually, when you look at the final time, like you mentioned, 143.6 seconds as opposed to 146.02, I think, at Santa, at the Holy Bull for uh, Hades. So a full three seconds faster than Hades ran at, at um, Goldstream. We know the track is a little bit slower, but the way he did it, he showed adversity. He ran into the mud. Brian Hernandez did a terrific job. He also won the Phillies version, the Martha Washington with, um, gosh, what's her name? Band of Gold for Kenny McPeak. We'll be hearing from Kenny a little bit later on, maybe tomorrow from Kenny McPeak. So it'll be really fun to see what he says about these two. But I'd never really heard of the horse, to be perfectly honest. He was not on my radar whatsoever, but he is firmly on it now. And he owns a win at Churchill Downs, which is oh so important. And it's also important the way he won that race at Churchill Downs because uh, this race didn't just like come out of nowhere. When he broke his maiden at Churchill Downs as a two-year-old in the in the uh, you know the late summer early fall, he got a buyer speed figure of ninety six. Yeah, I mean that I, when I saw that right there, I thought at the time I thought wow. I mean, this could wind up being literally, you know, the best two-year-old in the country or one of the best two-year-olds in the country. Came back in his next start. He was disappointing. McPeak said he was sick. Then he makes his next start in the Smarty Jones at Oakland. There was no excuse given for that. But I think maybe uh, being up on the lead head-to-head -head, uh, tactically might not have been the way he likes to be ridden. And he bounced back with another big speed figure in the Southwest. So it's going to be really interesting to see on a dry racetrack, assuming Oakland ever gets a dry racetrack for a three-year-old prep race, uh, to no. see how this horse, uh, how this horse runs. <laughs> yeah, not going to happen, Randy. Wishful thinking not mm. going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's turn our attention to Aqueduct. I don't have much to say about the Wither Stakes. I, I don't think it's going to have much impact on the Kentucky Derby. But I've been dying to do this, Zoe. Oh. I am going to stump Randy uh -oh. on the origin of a name of a horse. Oh, I love it. Uncle Heavy, the winner. Do you have any <laughs> idea where he got that you, name from? You've, already, you've stumped me all right. I don't even have to think about it, Bill. You have stumped me. <laughs> Okay. Um, it's trained by Butch Reed. Uncle right. Heavy is his brother, Mark Reed. And that's his nickname. Now, it's not because he's fat. It's because he was an outstanding wrestler in the heavyweight division in college. So Uncle Heavy, brother, Mark, Butch Reed, uh, you know, so you can save that one uh, I next will. time down the line. Okay, I will. So, I love it. I got him. I got him good. Well done, right. Bill. But 
Yes. But th- beyond that, I mean, it is what it is. It was the, the, the Withers. It was not a very strong race. Uh, congratulations to Butch Reed, who's a terrific trainer out of parks and uh, does such a good job. But uh, I don't really have anything else to add besides the little cute anecdote about the name. Uh, first graded stakes winner for Sire Social Inclusion, who stands at Woodford. So the guys at Woodford got to be very, very happy with that. Um, and we'll see where he goes next. I mean, it looks like perhaps he's going to stay in New York. Uh, he looked good. Uncle Heavy. I like the name. It's cool. Can I tell you about my latest rabbit hole escapade? Oh, oh yeah. Look, you, you, know, you, th- you, you think I'm the king of the rabbit holes, as Zoe likes to call me, right? So this probably has more to do with fierceness than anything else, and, and maybe even next year a little bit more than this year. But uh, So fierceness was the uh, the favorite in the last Kentucky Derby future wager, right? And understandably so. Uh, so I wondered, how have other horses that were favored in the late January, early February Kentucky future wager gone on to do? And it's not easy to find. So I went to newspapers.com, which is one of my favorite resources, and I went back year to year to year to year, and I I searched just for specific dates and just for specific uh, pools of the Kentucky Derby Future Wager, and I wrote down every horse that was the favorite in those particular pools from 1999, which was the beginning of the Kentucky Derby Future Wager, until 2023. 25 horses in all were favored in the late January, early February future wager. Wild guess, guys. How many of those 25 do you think went on to win the Kentucky Derby? Zero. Five. Zero. Really? Absolutely none. I thought that probably street sense would have been the favorite given his Breeders' Cup juvenile win at Churchill Downs. But no, no biz like showbiz was mm. actually the favorite on that particular derby pool. And then I thought maybe Nyquist would have been the favorite for his. But no, that wasn't the case either. I think that was Texas Red. So wow. zero for 25 and fierceness, we'll see. But, uh, you know, could be zero for 26. It's no wonder you don't have any hair. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder you're coming up with this you're just pulling it out as you're going along <laughs> and my latest rabbit hole the TD and Riders Room is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Horse Breeders Association the winner of the Withers Uncle Heavy not only named after the brother of trainer Butch Reed he's also a Pennsylvania brand how about that Three cheers to the Keystone State for another Pennsylvania bred big race winner. He got up to win it by picking up 20 Kentucky Derby points. He was bred by Barbara Reed, trained by Butch Reed. He's the son of social inclusion, and that follows an impressive performance for Uncle Heavy and the Wait for It Stakes, which was one of those races that we've been talking about that PA sired, PA bred races uh, that we all follow throughout the year. If you're interested in breeding to Pennsylvania, you can breed to a registered PA stallion and receive a 40% Breeders' Award for first, second, and third. And you're also eligible, of course, for that series for two-year-olds and now for three-year-olds. You can check out the 2024, 2024 Stallion and Boarding Farm Directory, which is available at the PHBA's website at www.pabread.com. PA Bread, I think we've built a, a brand at this point. The state of Pennsylvania has the best breeders program in the entire United States. Angel of Empire wins the Arkansas Derby and wins it clear. Caravelle in the Breeders' Cup Turf Sprint. Pennsylvania and the PHBA have the best state bred program in the country, bar none. The best breeders' awards and stallion awards in the country. Respect the law. He's earned it. A grade one winning juvenile. Tis the law, pops the cork in the champagne. A classic winning three-year-old. Tis the law is going to win the first leg of the Triple Crown. Five triple-digit buyers. Respect the law, tis the law. The best son of Red Hot Sire Constitution. He's left the others behind. He's going to win the run, Happy Travers. Tis the law. 
It's time for the Coolmore Stallion of the Week. And this week, that is Tis the Law, whose first two-year-olds will race in 2024. The big race last week, of course, was the Holy Bull, and it was in the Holy Bull in 2020, where Tis the Law started his impressive four-race winning streak. He had won the grade one champion at two, and after his three-length win in the Holy Bull, he would go on to win the grade one Florida Derby, grade one Belmont Stakes, and grade one Traverse Stakes. In fact, Tis the Law was a far better racehorse than his sire, Constitution, his grandsire, Tappet, or even his great-grandsire, Pulpit. That's some pretty fancy company. In fact, just like his great-great-grandsire, AP Indy, he won four grade one races, including one as a juvenile in the Belmont Stakes at three. Classic winner, Tis the Law, stands at Colmore for a fee of $20,000. The TD and Riders Room is brought to you by the Green Group, a tax accounting and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry and especially designed to save you taxes. And we welcome in now the Green Group Guest of the Week, the hottest man in horse racing, Kenny McPeak, coming off a huge weekend at Oakland Park where he won both the Martha Washington Stakes and the Southwest Stakes. Congratulations, Kenny. We don't want to get to all that, but will he have a chance, um, as you're well aware, a, a major passing in horse racing last night in Toby Keith. And I know you helped his team pick out uh, horses at the sales. Tell sure us a little did. bit about what you did for him and your recollections of him and your remembrances of him. Well, fantastic guy, Toby Keith. Um, real loss for the, for the sport. Um, I was kind of surprised, you know. I, kn- I knew he'd been fighting some health issues, but I didn't think that that uh, th- this would be as sudden as it is. And um, I had worked directly with Chris Bakari at, at, at several of the auctions, and we had partnered um, a list of really, really nice horses for Toby uh, that we were looking forward to racing for him over the next several years. And I'm not sure how all that unfolds, but um, just a real special guy for the sport and, um, you know, for all of us, um, just a sad moment. All right. Well, let's get to the Southwest Stakes, won by Mystic Dan. And uh, Kenny, sometimes, you know, trainers aren't surprised, even though it's, the horse was a long shot. Usually tell me I wasn't surprised that the horse won. Were you surprised that he won by eight lengths? Well, um, yeah, I think the eight lengths definitely surprised me. But um, this horse is is really fast, has been from the beginning. And initially, you know, I ran him twice in, in sprint races. And I really, after I did that, uh, I kind of regretted it a little bit because we had to re- retool him a little bit. He, he's he's so quick that you had to kind of reteach him, and he needed to learn how to go longer. And what he did this past weekend was pretty special in the sense that we've been a lot of repetition, setting off horses, letting him just go easy, and then learn to utilize that speed the last three furlongs. And, man, he was shot out of a cannon. And you know, a lot of credit goes to a list of people, you know, um, Greg Geyer, my assistant down at the fairgrounds, and, and Brian Hernandez had been getting on the horse regularly. But um, he was so classy in the paddock this past weekend. He stood there like a statue when we were saddling him. And um, this is the kind of mind that you need for these high-level races. And he may very well be that perfect type. Well, you've certainly been around enough good ones. I'm apologizing in advance, Kenny. It's great to see you. I'm at the Great Wolf Lodge. So if you hear a bunch of screaming children, they're not mine. They're getting ah. excited to go into a water park. So apologies in advance. Um, but back to your horse and back to Brian Hernandez. The ride he gave Mystic Dan was unbelievable. Do you Are you a believer that he's one of the most underrated riders in the sport? Obviously, he had the horse, partly because of you and your team that got him ready. But I thought that was terrific. Well, we're we're going on working together for pushing a decade now, and and um, you know um, I think Brian. I don't want anybody else to use him. I don't want him. To, I mean, you know, I don't need to toot his horn too too loud because it might get me in trouble. But he, you know, look, he's a consummate professional. It's there's nothing complicated about how he rides. There's not really a whole lot complicated about how we manage our horses either. But he's part of a team. And th- there's a lot of continuity with working with Brian. If I say, hey, we're working 5, 5.30 tomorrow morning, it doesn't matter what time. He's always 15 minutes early, which is a rarity for jockeys sometimes, usually racing to get in and get on and get out into the next one. But um, the other one that probably deserves a big tip, tip of the hat is Frank Bernice, his agent. You know, so, so Frank and I go over a list of horses on a regular basis, and we – 
uh, discuss the options. And yeah, Brian's my first choice. I, I don't put him on many horses where he, where he comes back and, and something was ridiculously wrong or handled wrong. Most of the time, if something went wrong, it's because he got caught in traffic or, um, you know, just a series of events that he couldn't control. And he'd be the first one to tell you that didn't go right. And that's reminiscent of Pat Day. Pat Day, when he rode for us back years ago, Pat would get off and say, well, that didn't go too well. He was the first one to admit when, when it wasn't right. You don't have to bring it up to Brian. He knows. And um, I typically don't give him um, a very much instruction unless it's a horse he just doesn't know anything about. But most all of them he knows in our stable. Kenny, the dip, one of the differences was this horse was racing a lot closer to the pace in recent races, and Brian took him back this time. Um, was that the plan? And do you think that that was to the benefit this horse's benefit? Well, that's that's uh, coming from the two times that I sprinted him. So his mind was thinking, I got to go because I'm going to run three quarters or or five and a half, and um, now we've got to go a mile and a sixteenth. So. Uh, that changes the dynamic. It took a couple of races, and, and, and his third start was a toss because he kicked up a lung infection, and in all honesty, I shouldn't run him back. I ran him back in two weeks because I thought this was a race he'd win pretty easy. Um, it didn't happen. But the last two starts, you know, he showed a speed in the in the first race at Oaklawn, and he backed up, I think, more than anything because he needed the run. But this time he was dead fit, and um, – you know, it, 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 total package. Talk to us about Band of Gold. I mean, you had a great day on Saturday t- with her taking the Martha Washington and paying $50. Well, um, you know, any filly that wins first time out, like she did at Churchill, obviously talented. I think that she got a little confused in her second start at the fairgrounds. Uh, we ran her in the untappable, but she was really awkward on her leads. Um, never really figured out what she was supposed to do out there. Um, so, so she was one that we somewhat had to regroup with and then, uh, you know, reschool her a little bit too. But in the paddock, you know, I eyeballed, I always eyeball the competition, who they're by, who they're out of, what they look like. Um, I'm a fan of that, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> and what, what, what's the good horses look like? What are the good horses look like? So I was looking in the paddock and I saw every horse I looked at said, well, it looks like a sprinter to me. It looks like a sprinter to me. And so I told Brian, I said, this looks like a bunch of sprinters here. Let them do their thing. Don't you worry about anything early. Um, if you can save ground, save it, because I think she'll need every inch of it. But don't let her loose until they until they straighten up. And that's what he did. And, they, and sure enough, looks like a group of sprinters backed right up to her. So um, we'll take it any way we can get it. Uh, Kenny, she is typical of, of what we've seen from your operation over the years. Uh, you you are not blessed to have Sheikh Mohammed or Mr. Magnier behind you. Um, you buy a lot of horses for relatively inexpensive prices. This one costs seventy thousand um, dollars. What did you see in her, and what did maybe other people miss about her? Well, I get no credit for purchasing her at auction. Um, the purchase was made by Bill Shively and his daughter. So. So they do that annually in that they, they go buy horses together. They also purchased Cocktail Moments, which was a nice filly uh, last season, season before. However, he sends me to the farm, Bill does, and, and I work with his team. And um, they'll line them up for me and say, who do you like? Who don't you like? And so they brought this filly out. They brought a, um, a uh, Malibu Moon filly out that was lovely. And so I said, yeah, okay, I like that one and that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, then, and then some of the other ones, they make decisions to sell them in the two-year-old sales or, or send to other trainers. But it's a real luxury to be able to go to a farm of the, of the magnitude and quality of Dixiana and, and handpick the ones you want. And, and um, you know, Bill allowed me to do that. And, but it, as far as the auction purchase, I have, have no connection to, to when they bought her at auction. Well, she's a very nice filly indeed. Kenny, you're approaching a milestone. You currently sit at 1,995. We've seen over the years that people kind of slow down dramatically when they're approaching a big milestone. Where would you love to get this done? 
It doesn't matter. You know, um, the truth is a lot of thanks goes to a lot of people that have worked really hard, a lot of clients that gave me a lot of horses to handle. Um, you know, I'm not going to dwell on it. Matter of fact, I got every intention of winning 3000 so um so we'll we'll keep rolling after that but we're not going to dwell on it long it's a wonderful milestone um you know we we've got so many nice horses that there's not a lot of time to to sit on you know enjoy it but we will i'm sure we'll probably toast something at some point and where it happens is is fine with me kenny so many big wins on your resume you got a swiss skydiver shirt on there of course we remember her for everything she accomplished and of course winning the preak mistakes but you have not won the Kentucky Derby. Um, in 1995, you finished second with Tejano Run. You must have thought this is pretty easy. I'm second in my first try. Um, you know, what about your history in the Derby, and how much do you yearn to, to get that magic win? You know, obviously, for somebody said, oh, being from Kentucky, is it a big deal? I think any horse trainer relishes to win a race like that. But, you know, it's got to come together on its own. You know, we've kind of been around the bull on it, we, you know, and Tahana Run, of course, and then Harlan's Holiday had a real chance. And I've had some other horses that had real chances that either didn't make the race um, or things just didn't go their way um, or, or certainly they weren't good enough. I've had some horses I ran that I didn't want to run, but there's 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 a lot of, uh, you know, things that go along with running one, and certainly ownership and such. But, um, you know, look, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. I'm not going to, you know, put all my eggs and uh, I don't have a full career if I don't win that race. But um, I do think that with especially the strength of the team that we have and, and uh, the, the group of horses and the clientele, some wonderful people that I work for right now um, that are giving me the freedom to make decisions that, that um, are in the best interest of their horses and, and them. And it's a, um, you know, look, it's, it's a journey. And, and uh, if it happens, it happens. And, if it doesn't, it doesn't. I'd, I'd love to win the Derby or Oaks. You know, I was born in Arkansas. People don't. Some people know that. Um, only because my father was in the military and was in. My mother came to visit him. But I've been second in the Arkansas Derby and been second in the Kentucky Derby. So we'd like to check a couple of those boxes at some point. Well, Kenny, I got a couple more questions. This one, courtesy of Randy the Rabbit Hole Moss. Now, he was supposed to be on this podcast with us, and he'd looked up some of your stats from the last year. You have yeah. broken the maidens of 25 horses over the past year, 17 of which were purchased at auction for an average price of $110,000. Now, of those 25 maidens you have broken, who's the best? Oh, goodness. Um that's you know, quite that's, a feat, that, by the way. Twenty-five maidens breaking over the last no, year. I don't think, you know, but 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 look, we get a lot of young horses. I mean, right. and you know, I went through a stage in my career back in the eighties and the nineties that I was primarily a claiming trainer, and I learned a lot during that period. Um, and then I went through actually ha had a deal in New Jersey that was really difficult to go through, and I'm sure Bill remembers it and others that that um, you know. They said I ran a horse that was questionable. It was a claiming filly. It was a sloppy racetrack. She she ended up breaking her, her cannon bone. But after that, I decided I just want young horses. And um, I want to develop young horses. And, and I, I started off, I can remember I was happy if I got five. And then I can remember one crop I had 12. And I think Tahana Run's crop, I only had seven or eight. And then Take Charge Ladies Crop came on, and I had, think I had 25. Oh, wow. And then Take Charge Ladies Crop was amazing. And Take Charge Lady, Harlan's Holiday, which I didn't purchase. That was Barry Burkelhammer. Repent. Sarava kind of fell in my lap. And so now, okay, I'm, and then, uh, then I've said, okay, I'd really love to have 30 every year. And now we're, I mean, the, the number 70. So look, look, the expectation to break those maidens is there too, because, you know, when I buy a horse for someone, you know, I'm looking for, you know, we've, we've what I call tasted the fine wine. We've had those graded steak horses. So when I buy one, I want to buy one that can win a graded steak race because that's where our, you know, our level of, of uh, expectations are. So, um, so we do a lot of that and we're still not throwing money at the game. Matter of fact, I tell the people that I work for, I don't necessarily want to throw money at the sport. I think we need to spend it wisely. 
I like buying out of young stallions. I like buying out of um, mares that haven't thrown a good horse yet because you can get value there. And then, you know, the, yeah, it'd be great to be able to spend a bigger budget, but, um, you know, maybe that comes. It doesn't matter. I mean, I, I work hard for those that want me, and that's all you can do. Kenny, I'm going to come at you totally out of left field with this, but I don't want to end the podcast without asking you the following question. People who don't know you that well don't may not realize you're somebody who's always thinking about the sport. You're, you think outside the box. You've done a lot of innovative things, and you're always thinking about how we can make this sport better. Are you, in, uh, are you enthusiastic about the sport's future, or are you a little bit worried? Um, I'm definitely worried. I've been worried for years. Um, you know, I can remember – you know, before simulcasting came in, that that horse racing, you know, we were running for peanuts at Churchill back then. And I've always believed we need to open this sport up to the masses and make it so easy for them to watch they can't stand it. But we continue to deny people the ability to watch. Um, when I say that, I, there are, yes, there are exceptions. However, you know, if I want to watch a race on my iPhone or my Android, I've got to open an ADW. I've got to be in the right state. I've got to have a credit card and open the ADW. Although I do think Naira is making it easier for people to watch on their app. Um, the, the, the jumping through the hoops for people to watch a race are too complicated, and, and we need to change it. I mean, I created the, the Horse Races Now app, which we actually shortened the name to Horses Now. But that thing continues to get its average 7,000 new users per month since it was it was launched. But we can't access video. There's there's certain entities that don't want us to have video. Um, We've been told that we need to take bets, but they won't let us do that either. But it continues to to aggregate more and more people and and, um, which I'm quite proud of. But I've lost a lot of money on that thing. Let's just say seven figures plus. Ooh. Yes. And um, but fortunately, my day job, hmm. which we talked about previously, has helped fund that. And um, and I'm still adamant that we're going to take that to another level. But um, the sports has to change the way we deliver to, to the young fans. I mean, young fans are the core of our future. And if we don't connect to them soon, then then we're then we're lost. Um you know, I could go on and on on this topic, right. and I'm still fighting my own battles, or when I say that, the good fight on horse races now trying to take it to another level, and there's some people out there that are contributing to that possibly happening. We want to, we want to take it to Samsung Television, Apple TV. We want it to be a worldwide uh, product that you can access any race, anywhere, anytime, um, but there's a lot of dots to connect, and that's going to take some time and money and cooperation and whether it's us that do it or someone else is hard to say, but we definitely need to make changes in this sport. How is it for you being a trainer in this sport nowadays? We've seen, uh, you know, what's happening with, with Heisa and the suspensions and the Engelhardt suspension, uh, buying the horse from the two-year-old sale. How hard is it being a trainer nowadays? Well, um, you know, the, the, the I's to dot and T's to cross on a daily basis have grown. Although I've got good people that, de- that help me do a lot of that. And I think that there's some positives that are coming out of HISA, but I also think that there's a lack of common sense mm-hmm. on some of it. I do think that they need someone like myself or some other trainers that are, that are regularly in the trenches to be able to direct them to what is more of a commonsensical approach to, to problem solving. I do not think that there's an enormous amount of cheating in the game. I think the guys that win races are the guys that are good trainers that have good horses. Um, I've lost a lot of horses in the claiming ranks over the years, and nobody does anything dramatic with any of them. So I question sometimes I think we're barking up the wrong tree with Heisa. And, and, and I have been very outspoken to, to, um, to Heisa and the people that work with Heisa. And they're wonderful people, by the way. You know, um, I'm trying to think um, of some of the names that are they're heading at Lisa is um, well-intentioned, but I've told her repeatedly, I think we need to address the media rights in the sport as much as we do the drugs in the sport. Um, I've, you know, talked to um, 
No, Jim, for getting um, with the Racing Commission in Kentucky and now with HISA. Mark Guilfoyle. Mark Guilfoyle, wonderful guy. Same thing. Mark, media rights are every bit as important. We need to worry about growing the sport as so much as catching bad guys. And, like, the angle card thing, I think, is honestly ridiculous. But um, there's some other things that they've done that are ridiculous, too. And they need to say, hey, wait a second, let's let's really figure this out. And, you know, on a really sensitive topic to some, I don't think what they're doing to Bob's fair either. I mean, I don't think what Bob Baffert has done is so egregious that he hadn't been able to run some really freakishly good horses in, in, in a race of the magnitude of the Derby. And it's a bit of a head scratcher to me. I hope they don't do that to me one day. Goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Ken McPeak, Kenny McPeak, congratulations. What a weekend and what a purse. $800,000 for a grade three at Oaklawn. I just uh, can't can't get over the kind of money that they're throwing around out there. But, of course, that's good for the game. And it was good for the Ken McPeak stable on Saturday. Good luck on the road to the Kentucky Derby and the Kentucky Oaks. By the way, since I do my Kentucky Oaks countdown, uh, where is Band of Gold likely to run next? More more than likely the honeybee. Honeybee, we were doing the math on that. Yeah, I think I think coming back in three weeks is okay for her because she hasn't run in a while. And, and um, you know we've got some others. Torpedo Anna, we're getting ready. Who was second in the Golden Rod? We've got Vivi's Dream going to run next Saturday. Or on the sorry on the seventeenth in the Rachel Alexander. That's a freaky good filly. Mm-hmm. Um, you know Sistina Chapel, who was third in the Untappable. She's going to probably come back. I may point her towards some turfway races. Um, Smile Happy's getting ready to make another run. Um, one of more difficult horses I've ever handled, and my team seems to have had him sorted now. Expect him to run big on the 17th of February, back at the fairgrounds again. So we've got a lot of depth, and, um, you know, it's a, it's a real luxury. Really Terrific. Nice. Well, Kenny, thanks so much for your time. Good luck with all those horses you mentioned. And uh, maybe on the first Saturday of May, they'll be taking your picture in the winner's circle. How's all that right, we got a long way, but we'll get there. <laughs> okay. Thanks, right. thanks so much, Kenny. Thank you all. As the Green Group Guest of the Week, Kenny McPeak, who's making all kinds of money at Oaklawn Park nowadays, will receive a free one-hour tax consultation with Lynn Green and the Green Group. For more information on how the Green Group can help you in your pocketbook around tax time, you can log on to www.greenco.com. Are you paying too much in taxes? The Green Group can help. There's a reason the most successful owners, breeders, and horsemen select the Green Group as their tax advisors. They save you money and share successful strategies. Over the past 40 years, the Green Group founder, Len Green, has owned and bred some of the best racehorses in the history of the sport, like Eclipse Award-winning champions Jaywalk and Wonder Wheel. His DJ stable competes at the highest level and has received the game's most prestigious honors. Len Green's in-depth, hands-on industry knowledge, combined with cutting-edge tax-saving strategies, has produced positive results for his clientele and has made the Green Group the top-rated accounting and tax firm in the thoroughbred business. For a confidential and complimentary consultation, contact us at 732-634-5100 or visit our website at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. And it's now time for First Things First. This week, decided I would catch up with Hall of Famer Bob Baffert and Flavian Pratt right after Nysos' very impressive win in the Grade 3 Bob Lewis. Nysos takes the Grade 3 Bob Lewis here with Hall of Fame trainer Bob Baffert, six in a row and his 12th overall in this race. Flavian Pratt, you were aboard Nysos. I have to say, I was a little concerned in the post parade because he's just so relaxed. Yes, he, he's very relaxed, but a good mind, just a good mind. Tell us the acceleration he gave you coming down the lane because it looks like he pressed a button and he just took off. Yeah, exactly. The pace was pretty hot, so it, it was good. Uh, you know, I gave him a chance and he took the delt very well. And uh, yeah, when I call on him, he responded really well. Thanks for your time. We'll let you go. Bob, six in a row. One, two this year. One, two, three, four last year. How good is Nysos? 
Well, I mean, it feels to be blessed to have horses like this, you know, year after year, and I have the great clientele that I have to put me in this position. And it's nice to see these horses that are trained well. They, you know, sometimes they'll fool you, but uh, they both showed up today. All right, Bob, thanks for your time. Best of luck throughout the day. Thank you. Nisos takes the Robert B. Lewis. Many thanks for Bob and Flavian. It looks like we'll find out where that horse is headed next. But do want to remind you, as the rain continues to fall here in Southern California, we will be back racing on Friday with a nine race card. Saturday, we'll have a 1230 post and an early post on Sunday, 11 a.m. for Super Bowl. We will have some rescheduled stakes from last week, the Las Virgines and the San Marcos. And of course, we will have the Palos Verdes on Saturday. Looks like big city lights will go forward as the favorite in there. But a good weekend of racing coming up at Santa Anita. And guys, who are you picking for Super Bowl? Which direction are we going? Kansas Kansas City. Kansas Kansas City. Chiefs, Chiefs for me yeah. as well. Chiefs, yeah, Chiefs I mean, me a lot of respect, a lot of respect for the 49ers, but uh, I think the Chiefs are at this. To me, this is Andy Reid's best coaching job yet. Yeah, absolutely. And Patrick Mahomes' father used to play for the Red Sox. How about that? He's also <laughs> oh, in jail right the now. Truth, I think. The truth comes out. That's why Bill yeah, likes uh, likes the Chiefs. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And there's nothing to do with Taylor Swift. I uh, don't. Um, I'm a little old to be a Swifty. So yeah, I, I think it's great. I don't know why everyone's dogging on poor old Taylor Swift. They should. Oh, this is, is absolutely wonderful. It's Good great. For the yeah. game. Yes, absolutely. I wish he would have got fallen in love with a jockey. And yeah, you, know, you can see here at all the horse races. I'll do that. I don't yeah. mind. I'll take one for the team. I could. Yeah. yeah I bet you will. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, if, if he gets tired of Taylor, we'll, we'll put in a good word for Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, okay. So this is usually the point in the uh, podcast. We like to talk about the races coming up this weekend. Um, no surprise since it was su- such a big uh, weekend last week. Uh, it's very quiet. The only race with any um, uh, connection to the Kentucky Derby this is Sam F. Davis at Tampa, which is the prep for the Tampa Bay Derby. We learned today that Locked, who would have been the favorite in there, the Breeders' Futurity winner for Todd Pletcher, is out of the race with a temperature. Um, horse to watch in there is Change of Command, uh, just to see if Shug McGahee can get a horse on the road to the Triple Crown. He's a recent allowance winner, and he cost uh, $1.050 million at Keeneland September. So I think he would be the likely favorite in there. And I'd love to see Shug come up with a good uh, triple crown candidate. Guys, anything else to add to that? I get road for sure. Um, Oh, that's right. Yeah. He's going to be in there for Todd and we'll see how he handles the main track. Uh, He ran well in his debut at, at Saratoga running second to trade and balance. And we've seen time and time again, turf horses running pretty well at Tampa Bay Downs and Todd has taken this road before to get to the Derby. So I'm actually really looking forward to seeing how Agate Road handles everything on Saturday. Yeah, two completely different running styles. Obviously, Change of Command is pretty aggressive and likes to be right up into the mix, if not on the lead. And Agate Road on a faster pace uh, dirt race, he may find himself 15 links back. I mean, he's got zero speed at all, uh, but he's got a a heck of a late kick. One other, I mean, there's a lot of other horses in here that, that, you know, that could be part of this. It's a pretty evenly matched race on paper. Um, But there's a horse that you may want to consider, and that would be no more time. A horse that was the second choice at two to one and a mucho macho man that so many of those horses came out of that ran in the Holy Bull. And he really didn't have much of a chance in the mucho macho man. Uh, he broke in the air and got away last. He's a horse that wants to be up in the mix as well. And then he was four wide all the way around the turn and made a decent run and then kind of emptied out a little bit. The race before that was a win at Gulfstream where he looked pretty good going a mile in a maiden race. So I think he might have a chance chance to get part of this uh that's just another horse i'll throw in the mix there all right uh, guys last week i wrote a story for the thoroughbred daily news which raised a lot of questions i, I think and to give you a brief uh, take on it uh, trainer jeffrey Engelhart was uh hit with a one of those potential two-year suspensions from Haiwu for uh, having a horse test positive for a banned substance in this case clem buterol um he's still training waiting for the uh, split sample to come back but um 
his story is that, well, let me give you the background some more a little bit. He bought the horse at June in Ocala at two-year-old sale. And then he took the horse right away to his barn at Finger Lakes. In November, the horse broke down, unfortunately, in a workout and had to be put down. That's when Haiwu came in and did all the tests, which I believe they do on, on any time a horse breaks down. And they found in the hair sample, clembuterol. So they then went from there to give um, the suspension to Engelhart. And his contention is that in the hair samples, they go back, you could find something that was administered to a horse even as much as a year before the time the test is out. He believes that the horse was given clembuterol by the consigner who put him in the sale so that he would obviously work faster in, in the workouts and uh, believes that he is completely innocent and that they've got the wrong guy. It does raise an awful lot of questions. Uh, Zoe, but one thing that, uh, and you would be the best to uh, have a take on this. Uh, Engelhart said clembuterol uh, use at two-year-old sales is rampant. Do you believe, do you buy that? I mean, I know that Nick Demerick penned a letter to the TDN the very next day defending the two-year-old sales. And I actually spoke to Nick yesterday and we had a long conversation about the two-year-old sales. Yes, he is on the board. And he basically said that, you know, the two-year-old sales are the most tightly regulated segment of the horse racing industry thus far. They have lots of medication hoops they have to jump for, through 24 hours, 72 two hours, everything has to be regulated. And I said to him, but well, what about the clenbuterol? They do random testing on about 20% of horses that go through the two-year-old sales. I think over the years, they may have found two horses that tested positive for clenbuterol. Those horses were scratched and sanctions were given. Now, the elephant in the room here with the hair samples is that, yes, you can c go back to a year we need some kind of uniformity between all of the sales groups. You have OBS, you have Keeneland, you have Fazig Tipton. They need to get together and try and figure this out because clenbuterol was originally for sick horses. I can remember growing up in England and now it's called Ventipulman. We used to put a scoop of Ventipulman into the hunter's feed, the horses that had a cough. And that was just these old hunters that were sending out to go hunting. I came over here and I keep hearing clenbuterol. I didn't know what it was. I looked it up and I'm like, Fenta Pullman? That's what we used to give the hunters in England. It is for helping horses. Now, what if you got a sick foal? You take your sick foal, it's got pneumonia. You take it to the vet, it gets clenbuterol. Now, the Heiser records do not come in place on horses until they've had a timed workout. They get registered and every medication has to be registered thus forward. But if you've got a foal that's been administered clenbuterol, the foal gets sold at, as a weanling and then gets sold as a yearling and then gets sold at the two-year-old sales and then you get a positive clenbuterol sample from a hair sample. How do you know who's responsible? I think this is something that needs to be looked into. And I understand what Nick is saying with the two-year-olds. They are very tightly regulated. I spoke to Marat Farrell, who I do a lot of work with at the two-year-old sales, and she'd been speaking to a couple of her clients, Border X-Line Racing, about perhaps doing hair samples at the upcoming two-year-old sales. And they're going to look into this and just see. OBS have said that they will... Apparently, nothing is written in stone, but on a, a hair sample. But things take a long time to go through. And then at the same time, who's responsible? This is going to be a, an awfully big can of worms because everyone is going to pass the buck at some point. It wasn't me. It was them. It was this guy. It was that guy. It's the same thing that we've all been talking about. At some point, someone has to be held responsible. Now, it's impossible to test every horse in the cell. That's going to cost a fortune. Or is it? I don't know. So it, it's certainly food for thought, but we will continue buying at two-year-old sales because it, it's proven that they do better, they race longer, and the records out of two-year-old sales are second to none. So far, what Haisa and Hai Wu have done a pretty good job of doing is uh, – uh, 
being flexible and being uh, adjusting penalties when evidence is brought to them that it may have been unfair. And it, you know, it, this is why it may have been unfair. To me, this smacks of one of those situations. I'll be surprised if what, if, uh, if, everything seems to be the way it is. I'll, I'll be surprised if they don't adjust Engelhardt's suspension. Um, I found it particularly interesting, Bill, in your story about what he's doing himself, uh, testing the segments of hair. To me, that was, uh, you know, as a as a former sort of med student, I, I, I thought that was fascinating. And it makes sense because as hair grows out, the the oldest part of the hair is what would you would think would have the highest concentration of the of the of the clenbuterol. And so he himself has had the hair samples is having the hair samples tested to try to prove that the clenbuterol was given before he bought the horse at the sale. To me, that's kind of a fascinating thing and could just add more uh, to his uh, to his evidence there. Yeah, definitely. But uh, the Heise will not would, would not tell me if they are going to use that same test, that same sort of segmented test or not. Um, but, you know, so he, he brought up a lot of good points. And, and it's not just the sales. If if a drug can stay in a horse's system for a year and show up in a hair test or some other hair test, look at these horses, you know, these thirty five thousand dollar claimers. They might get claimed three, four times a year. Horse could be in a in a, in a five, four or five different barns through the course of a year, and then he tests positive for clenbuterol, you're going to just automatically say the, la- the trainer that has him now is the guilty one? I mean, that's that, that can't possibly be. Uh, I mean, I don't know how you change things through the trainer responsibility rule, but that would seem tremendously unfair. Well, some some tracks have started to incorporate Bill uh, hair testing for clenbuterol in their uh, in their standard order business because what was happening in the past, you know, clenbuterol was first really used as uh, it, it, it's been it's been a, a breathing drug uh, for a long period of time, but then trainers also learned that it had certain steroidal qualities. It would kind of mimic the impact of anabolic steroids on a horse, help them build up muscle mass and things like that, right? And so when anabolic steroids were outlawed in thoroughbred racing, a lot of trainers just switched. Okay, we can't use steroids. We'll use clenbuterol. It's the next best thing. And when racetracks went to, uh, you know, to rules about clenbuterol, okay, you have to, you know, pull it within three weeks or whatever, the way trainers would try to get around that is they would give massive doses of clenbuterol up until that cutoff time. Then they would stop. And the horses would still have traces uh, that you know their their bodies would still be feeling the positive impacts of the clenbuterol, right? Uh, and muscle mass and things like that, even if the horse wouldn't necessarily test positive for clenbuterol. And that's when some of these tracks went instead to hair sample testing. So that they can catch these guys that have been using clenbuterol in that manner. So that ball is kind of already rolling in thoroughbred racing and the sales. It might be a good idea for that as well. Yeah, well, stay tuned. And, uh, you know, the other thing that people bring up is that Heiza does not start with a horse until they have their first published workout. So Heiza slash Haiwu has no, uh, no jurisdiction at the yearling or two year old sales at all. So, and some people think that they need to change that. I, I don't know if they should or not, but that's another uh, subject for food for thought somewhere down the road. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by XBTV. The XBTV workout of the week is White Barrio, who worked a sparkling five furlongs in 59 and three on February the 3rd for trainer Rick Dutro solo with regular rider Emily Ellingwood in the saddle. We all know he is pointing toward the February 24th, $20 million Saudi World Cup. Assistant trainer Chip Dutro said the horse was feeling great after his work. I can attest that Emily said the same thing as well. Looks like he'll leave for Saudi on February the 13th. This horse could not possibly be doing any better. He's ready to run, babe. He (laughs) is ready to roll, babe. Although he, he, you know, he could probably use another sharp work because he's a pretty good doer, guys. Like he's, he's got a bit of an old belly on him right now. He's, he's feeling pretty good. He is a very good doer. So we've had some very sharp works for him back to back. Just, Just putting him under the hammer just a little bit.
all the thrills. Fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. The TD and Riders Room brought to you by West Point Thoroughbreds, whose partners were vaulted into the world of instant camaraderie just this past week when Happy I Am, owned by West Point, picked up her third straight win for the partners when she took a fairgrounds allowance race by five and a half lengths as the three to five favorite and looked pretty darn good doing it. And don't forget the John Sadler trainee, Scatify, who was sent to the early lead in the Bob Lewis against Nisos, actually beat Wind Me Up to the front in that race and Still held on to finish third, owned by West Point. Scatify broke his maiden December the 16th at Los Alamitos. Looked pretty good then as well. And was a $120,000 Phasic Tipton mid-Atlantic two-year-old. If you're interested in becoming a part of the West Point experience, you can go to www.westpointtb, as in thoroughbred.com. All right, that's a wrap on this week's show. I want to thank my partners, Randy Moss, Zoe Cadman, our producers, Katie Petruniak and Anthony LaRocca, and our editors, Leah LaRocca and Nathan Wilkinson. It's Lucy time. What's up? Uh, uh, uh. I didn't pick her up and hold her here because she's not really ready for the red carpet. She's, uh, she's she 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 looks a little strag scraggly right now, but uh, she's going to, to the beauty shop today, Bill. So she'll look really good for next week. Great. So we'll, have, we'll have Lucy all primmed and proper for next there week's show. Go. All right. All right, Doodle, everybody. Thank you. There, there's Doodle. She's ready. Oh, hi, Doodle. It's all about the dogs. All right. All dogs. Thanks so much for listening and viewing us this week. We'll be back next week with another edition of TDN Writers Room. See you then. Bye, guys. <laughs>